那我们今天很高兴的能够邀请到我们韩国的 GDG 的 Uniop 的那个主持 organizer， 那 Mr. Yong 还有 Jennifer。那他们今天这两位会来这边跟各位分享一下，在那个 G D G 部分的东西，尤其是在 Game 的部分。他们 Mr. Yong 工作于那个 Net Marble， Net Marble， I'm sorry， Net Marble， OK。他们 Net Marble 是一个 Game Company， 不过他们除了在制作一些 Mobile Game 之外，他们同时间也尝试的在像 AI 或是一些那个 Machine Learning 相关的一些应用。所以他们今天有一些相关的分心得可以跟各位分享，尤其是在 Game 的部分。那我们现在先欢迎 Mr. Young， Let's welcome to Mr. Young and Jennifer。Thank you for having me. Hello, everyone. <laughs> My name is Yong.、Uh, I'm from South Korea. Okay. Let me start my session、uh, about autoencoder and anomaly detection using ML engine. So here is the agenda. Before I start, I will be talking about my profile, and for the following. Would be about what is the anomaly detection, why we use such algorithm, and how the system looks like. What is Google Cloud Platform's ML engine? Also, I will be talking about how we established our anomaly detection system for the Marvel games and how the architecture looks like. Finally, I will show you the prediction results of our system. First of all. I am an organizer of Google Cloud Platform Korea User Group and Google Developer Group Cloud Chapter in South Korea. On the other hand, I am also a team leader in the Marvel AI Revolution Center. What could anomaly case in data distribution? In the figure, red triangles would be the outliers since they are away from rest of data points. Let's go deeper into related business case.、Uh, let's first have a look at game business features. Comparing to other services, game services take much longer time to release, and requires many experts from various fields. Therefore, we need to gather as many users as possible in short time. So we spend a tremendous amount of money for marketing. Also, the game trends spread really quickly. Tips like how to hunt monster, monsters with extreme difficulty, or even ways to earn game money for、uh, sorry game money by abusing game bugs will spread out in a moment. Another point is there are many reasons for marketing a game project life short, and among these, abnormal behaviors in game is the most critical one. As I just said, abnormal behavior spreads out fast. If everyone behaves abnormally,、uh, many users will not pay for the game anymore. Therefore, abnormal behaviors in game is a threat to game economy. Let's have a look on example of abnormal behavior. These are some representative abnormal behaviors. Some people modify memory to change their character's attack power or attack speed, and in other case, they change their game money. As you can see in the screenshot on the right, this person, this person's character level is 40 and 56 and 58, which is not even max level, but has ranked number four among all of the users. We've checked the data and found out that. This user has modified the memory and had an attack power much higher than the actual character's stats.、Uh, and by replicating packages that were sent to game servers when an event occurs, such as cash rewards or in game purchase, they try to deceive the game server as if this kind of event occurred many times. More than actual occurrence. Finally, by using bot or macro program, they gather up game money much more faster than game director's、um, intention. So, 
This also could be an um, abnormal behavior. The graph you are looking at is an um, example of DAU of game Terra M. And as you can see, DAU was seriously affected by abnormal behaviors by uh, the horizontal axis is date, and the vertical axis is the count of users logged in in a day. Have a close look at the red box in the graph. There was an event which gave game money to each game account. Soon after, some users found a flaw in the event. They started to create new accounts, received game money, and send the game money to his or her uh, main account by trading. And repeating this over and over, this went on um, for several days. Due to this happening, DAU increased steeply. And then there was a game patch, so the game money was only given to the accounts created before the game event, not the, not the ones that were um, newly created. Therefore, a user stopped creating new accounts, and the account created only to receive the game money were never used again. So that's why the DAU fell steeply. But the point is, did the users come back after game patch? No. One mistake makes many users turn away and never come back. Most users don't forgive the, uh, this kind of mistakes. As you can see, the, this kind of abnormal behavior can ruin a game with hundreds and thousands of people's hard work. And it only takes a moment. So until now, I've been talking about what abnormal behavior is and why it is so important to detect. Our situation was like this. We used unsupervised learning since we had no label. There's a team where uh, they make a final call if a user has done abnormal behavior or not. In order to lessen their labor and time, we had to tell why such user seems suspicious, so we needed a hint for our prediction result. Also, in terms of prediction and recall, the operation team wanted to be able to dynamically change the cutoff according to their resource situation, I mean human resource. So we need a number that shows how abnormal user behavior is. Under this situation, we surveyed some papers and had, had a workshop with Google and brainstormed. Finally, we got a result that autoencoder would, would be the best. <clears throat> Look at the figure starting from left to right. There's an image of number two, uh, which is an input data. The input data goes through encoding layer and becomes compressed, compressed data, which is called bottleneck layer in the middle. This is where embedded vector is created. Next, there are decoder layers, which reconstruct the image with the compressed representation. And after going through all hidden layer in the decoder, we can see the fake reconstructed image of number two as output. The image uh, of number two on the right doesn't look exactly like the, the one on the left. But as you can see, the image is reconstructed very uh, like the original input. Autoencoder compresses input data and reconstruction of the data. It's well known for fi finding sparse data. We have chosen our infrastructure considering our current situation. We had a limited time to train our model while we had a, a huge amount of data. So we needed, we needed distributed learning. However, we know, you know that this thing is quite, quite a challenging. 
Even if you established your distributed training, you would never know uh, when it might have issues. There are quite a number of games that Netmarble has published, and we had to implement the anomaly detection system to most of games. To save our time, we created a base model, and by using this, you, we can create uh, we can create a new model for each games by feature engineering and hypertune. Moreover, each modelers have their own preference of frameworks. Framework compatibility was also an important criteria. Also, the ability to change prediction mode considering latency or data amount, and ability to change node scale were also important features, factors. When you choose our infra, ML Engine was the perfect, perfect solution to satisfy all of kind things, so that's why we choose ML Engine without hesitation. ML Engine proceeds train and prediction like this. After storing our train or prediction data in Google Cloud Storage, we request how many nodes we want uh, used for training with some argument using gcloud SDK. Then the ML engine internally sets certain number of worker nodes and leads the train files from Google Cloud Storage. Worker nodes periodically update model parameters to parameter node, and the result is sent back to worker node. After model training in fi is finished, the model parameters are saved in Google Cloud Storage. Then we can register our model in ML Engine for prediction API. We can do prediction with gcloud SDK using model name and version name. Now, let me introduce Jennifer, <laughs> who will be talking about the uh, ML Engine is used in practice. Please welcome Jennifer. Hello everyone, my name is Jennifer O, and I'm here to talk about uh, how this kind of project is actually um, processed. And I'll be showing you some, uh, some demos so that you can easily use the ML engine in production. So this is the whole process of uh, producting the ML engine. So as you can see, there are a big seven steps. I'll be going through all these steps in detail. Okay, first of all, you have to uh, make some code to run on ML engine. Okay, uh, sadly, I cannot show the exact code because of uh, my company's security. But to show this in brief, there are these kind, these types of methods. So there are input functions and model functions. These are the two methods that you have to change in order to uh, process your own model with your own data. There are many codes in the GitHub where many Googlers have pushed, so you can easily use those codes to uh, start with your own project. So if you have done uh, uh, coding your uh, model, then you have to run it locally to test if the model is working right. So uh, in order to run the ML engine code in local uh, environment, you have to use this kind of uh, commands. You will be seeing this kind of commands uh, in the next few slides. So to explain briefly, the first line would be the gcloud command. And from the second line to the blank line would be the uh, train, uh, train parameters, train settings. And from starting from the blank line to the end, would be the model parameters that would be used in the model code. Let's see how these kind of commands work. You submit the commands, and the model will automatically run. Okay. 
And as, as you can see, the, they are showing the loss value and steps. And as you can see, the loss value is going down. So this is how you test the ML engine code locally. And it also proceeds evaluation and also ex exporting the model. If you have tested the model locally, then you have to submit it to ML Engine. Okay, this is an example of how uh, the jobs are submitted. And the point here is that if you, once you submit your job, you can never erase it. So if you fail, there will be fail marks, or you can stop the job in the middle, but you can never erase it. So you have to be really careful when you submit the job, or else you have some uh, dirty uh, job list like this. So you ha in, in order to avoid this, you have to run locally and test it. OK, this is the command that will submit the training job to the ML engine. It's not locally running. So as you can see, the bold parts are the a difference. And there are some more commands here, as you can see. So this is the part where you can change from non-distributed non -distributed learning to distributed uh, environment. The only part you have to change is the scale tier. As you can see, the basic would be the default, uh, default scale tier where you only use one node. And the standard and custom are the distributed learning environment. As you can see, there these are the scale tiers that are provided from GCloud SDK. And the second one is the standard, where you use four, parami four workers and three parameters. There are other, uh, other scale tiers, such as premium or basic GPU. And in order that those uh, numbers of nodes or specs of the no machines are fixed. So if, in order to use your own environment, you have to use custom, which I'm going to talk in the next slide. You have to fix the config file in order to use custom scale tier. Okay, this is the config file of each uh, scale tiers. You don't actually have to do anything for basic and standard since you are using the already made environment. But in order to use custom, you have to say what kind of, what type of machine you're going to use for master and worker and parameter nodes. And also you have to set the numbers of the nodes. The master node is always one, so you don't have to put any numbers for it. So these are the machine types that is provided by the GCloud SDK. And as you can see, some nodes, are, some machines are specialized in CPU, and some machines are specialized in memory. So you can choose your own environment according to your needs. Also, there's a TPU on the bottom for beta service. Okay, let's have a look at how a basic uh, training goes. Okay, this you have actually submitted the training job to ML Engine, and you can see there is a new job there. And as as time goes by, the the job has finished, and you can see the resource usage of each node. And since you this is the basic scale tier, there's so there's only one node, so there's. There were only one node metrics. Okay, let's have a look at the custom. So you've set the config file and submit the job. It goes same by same with the basic, but the difference is is that you are using distributed learning. As you, as you can see, the config that you have set is shown there. 18 workers and three parameter nodes. 
And here is the difference is that there are many uh, many other nodes, three parameter nodes as you can see, and 18 workers, and all this uh, resource uh, status can be shown here. So you have run your uh, model in the ML engine. Then the next step is to uh, tune your model. So you have to hyperparameter. You have to do hyperparameter tuning. Okay. So ML engine, they they provide a, a service called hyper hypertune, which is uh, which you automatically does the hyperparameter tuning for you. And the difference in the command line is the only the bold part here, which is a HP tune config file. And let's have a look at that. So here you set all the parameters you want to do hyperparameter tuning. So in this on this config file you want you would use layers and dropout rate for the tuning. The goal of this hypertune config is minimizing the loss value, which is on the hyperparameters metric tag. And it could be any other values defined in TensorFlow summary in the model code. And there are also trials. Uh, you can, as you can see, there are max trials and max parallel trials. The max would be how many trials you want to run in total. The max parallel trial is how many trials you want to run simultaneously. So in this case, you would run totally eight trials, but there will be two trials running at the same time. So there will, there will be two, 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 two. Okay. The important thing here is that hypertune not only eliminates the repeated work of hypertuning, hyperparameter tuning, but it also finds a better parameters by referencing uh, prior trials results. So therefore, if you put the max parallel trials too high, that means there would be less trials to get reference. So it would not uh, work well. So you better keep that low. Let's have a look at how hyper Hypertune works. It goes same with the other train jobs. So that, as you can see, the type is hyperparameter tuning. And you'll see the parameters that you have set. When the job's finished, the ML engine will show the results of all the trials that have tested. There are some sets of parameters that uh, they were tested. And these this, uh, trials are in order. So the one on the top is the best efficient uh, trial. Layers two, five, six. So you might want to check how these uh, hyperparameter tunings have worked. So you can check this on TensorFlow TensorBoard. You can check the, all the trials results on here. And you can compare these uh, one by one. So by looking at this, the first trial is worse than the second trial. Let's have a look at the first of uh, the best efficient one, the eight, number eight one. Number eight, the best, uh, had the best result. So can compare these results by using TensorBoard. So when you have run the hypertune well and chosen your parameters, you can uh, run the prediction. And you can also test it by locally. Let's have a look at the local prediction. So you've run your hyperparameters. And if you want to test the local prediction, you have to know the directory of the model. So this is the directory of the model where it's exported. There will be like 
model file and variables. And you can use this gcloud command to just run the prediction locally. And there will be results right away. These are the prediction results. So you've tested that the prediction is working well. So you must register in order to use it as a production. So you register the model. There are two big steps in registering the model. First one is you have to create the model. And then the second step is you have to create a version in the model. You only have to create a model once. But you, every time a mo newly model is created, you have to create a version. In, in our case, uh, we, for anomaly detection in game, we train our model every day, so there will be new model every day. That means we are creating version every day. The bold part here is the model name. And you can use the model name while the versions are changing every day. If there are some settings in the prediction. The auto scaling default mode is where is the default environment where you the Node, nodes are set to zero while it's not used. And when there are some predictions coming in, the, the node, node, number of nodes will go up. But when there are too many prediction data, there, er there will be some errors like too many requests or internal errors during the scale up. So you have to set some other uh, settings, such as setting the min node for auto scaling or using the manual scaling. As you can see, they, they have a uh, higher uh, default nodes. So it, this would have uh, much better performance and would uh, proceed product prediction much faster. However, this means this, uh, this environment costs more because even if you don't have any prediction, uh, prediction, there will be still some nodes there waiting for you. So that means there will be cost during there is no prediction at all. So although this, is, this setting is much more faster, it costs much more. OK, let's have a look at how registering model goes. You've created the model and then use uh, register your version in the model. It takes a few minutes. So the version is created, and you can run prediction on the model. So the version and models are all created. So you can run your um, online or batch prediction for your production level. There are two types of prediction here. One is online prediction, and one is batch prediction. And as you can see, there are some pros and cons. Uh, the online prediction only uses the files locally, but it has some pros that it runs fast, and you can see some metrics, or the row order is guaranteed. But it cannot uh, do any prediction with many rows or many uh, big size files. On the other hand, batch prediction uses only files in GCS, and it runs with huge data. But however, you have to wait for it, and you don't know when it would end, so you have to keep monitoring it. And the row order is not uh, guaranteed, and the, those files uh, results of the files will be distributed. These are the commands here for online prediction and batch prediction. As you can see in the batch prediction, you have to set the output path where the results will be saved. Let's have a look at online prediction. These are the files.
And if you run online prediction, it runs, it gives the results directly. It's pretty much same as the local prediction. Okay, let's have a look at batch prediction. So this is kind of same as uh, submitting a job. So there will be prediction job there. And once the prediction job is finished, there will be results saved in the output path that, output path that you have set it. And they are distributed, as you can see. It is just the prediction results. So that's it for uh, running your ML engine for production. Okay, I'll be back to back to you, Young. Okay. Uh, this is an example of application architecture for anom anomaly detection system of uh, marble feature fight game. There are two tasks scheduled by Jenkins scheduler. One is for training and the other one is for prediction. We trained our model uh, once a day. Like all other services, users, users have different behavior patterns. Same here. There were various patterns according to paid amount of, and play time. So it was almost impossible to predict all users' be behaviors uh, using only one model. We segmented users into four types by user patterns to solve this problem. Then we created a model trained and predict uh, for each segment. The segmentation conditions may vary among EDA results for each game, but for this game, we used the pay amount per period uh, for the condition. We predicted user behaviors every one hour. We used user behaviors within uh, latest one hour, segmented them with the same condition as training. And then find the right model to, for, for the segment. Then from the model, <coughs> we get prediction research with scores, which means how much a user's behavior is suspicious, and report it to stakeholders. With the same features, we can get different insights by how we pre-process our training data by choosing whether whether we use a uh, fixed window or a session window or a sliding window. And by setting the parameters for sliding window, such as window interval, window size, and so on, we'll have different effects on prediction accuracy. I think there is no fixed, win ans fixed answer he here. Some games may have better performance with fixed window and some um, maybe better with a sliding window. So we have to run them and see the results because all games have different data patterns. We have, we have chosen our best option after testing each case. 
for Marvel Feature Fight game, there was a maximum 10% 10% difference in accuracy among different windowing options. As I said before, we used uh, autoencoder for the network. Autoencoder takes six time sequences of user behaviors for the input data, and the data goes through the encoder and decoder hidden layers. Each hidden layer used high public tangent for the uh, activation function. Let's go deeper into the layers. When I talked about segment, I said that we have different models for different user behavior patterns. We also tune hyperparameters separately for each model. The number of layers and nodes in the figure is a result of certain segment hyperparameters tuning. This is the best set of parameters we got from ML Engine, ML Engine's HyperTune. There are different layers for candidates, but for segment in Marvel Feature Fight game, this network had the best result. Seems like not all deep layers have better performance. These are train loss graphs of each segment with uh, each set of best hyperparameters. Seems like four segments are all trained well. For Marvel Feature Fight, we submitted um, with this argument for training and prediction. The number of rows differ among segments, but we uh, use the same number of steps for all segments while avoiding overfitting. We had the same number of train steps, so we used the same setting for distributed learning a training environment. For this case, we used 18 worker nodes and three parameter servers. And for prediction, we used different infra for each segment. For example, segment one has the largest amount of data, so we used manual scaling with 30, node, 30 nodes. And for segment four, which has least amount of data, we used auto scaling. This is an uh, example of reports sent to the stakeholders. The PID would be a user's unique PID, unique ID. Score is the distance of input data and the data reconstructed from autoencoder, which represents how much the data is abnormal. Feature description is the feature that um, was the most abnormal. We call it a hint. Look at the green box user. The hint is uh, showing that this user has modified memory and changed maximum damage. And the score for 1,538, meaning that this user is highly likely to be an abuser. This is the maximum damage of the user from the previous slide. As you can see in the red box, the number exceeds 2,000 million. Seems like this user had a very high score because he or she had value of the uh, 1,000 time high, times higher than normal users. This is an example of event replication from network sniffing. sniffing. TID is a, a unique transaction ID. Look at the green box. My cache is the amount of cache the user is holding. Get cache is the amount of cache the user owned. Uh, have a closer look at the red box and the, and the green box. It looks like the user has on uh, five, 550 cache in every 10 milliseconds, but cache holding did not change. The TID is starting from second row, and uh, second row are all the same, but uh, this doesn't seem like a normal purchase event. In this case, we have checked that this user only purchased once, and the other events were not real. So we concluded that 
Mm, this user has captured the event and tried to replicate it. So to sum up, the first example was about rarity of the value, and the second example would be about rarity of repeated behavior. This graph is comparing prediction result from our machine learning model and uh, with machine learning model with uh, rule-based result. Both rule-based and our model had a high uh, threshold, resulting in accuracy of 100%. As you can see, the machine learning model has two to 10 times more counts than the rule-based model, rule-based system. So that's it uh, for sharing my experience of game anomaly detection with machine learning. Thank you. Okay, I think we have one minute left. Oh, we have one minute. Can we have a question? 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 Okay, if you have any questions, then we will use Yong and Jennifer. They will be in the room today, so you may be a little bit of a question. If you don't have to ask questions, it's okay. If you have time to finish or if you have time to finish, we can ask Yong and Jennifer to ask them a question. Then we will thank Mr. Yong and Jennifer. Thank you.